Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got a packed house, so I think it's time to start. My name is Arthur Carty, and I'm the executive director of the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. And it is a distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Martin Moskovitz as a WIN distinguished lecturer to what is our new home, uh, the new home of nanotechnology in the Quantum Nanocenter. In fact, this is the first distinguished lecture uh, that we've been uh, had in this building. Uh, and this class is at this lecture theater, of course, is one of two identical uh, lecture theaters for the nanotechnology engineering students. The other one is down below. Now, Professor Moskovitz has been a, a friend uh, for many years and will be remembered by some of our WIND faculty, the older ones, that is, from his days at uh, the University of Toronto, where he was a professor from 1973 to 2000 and uh, chair of the chemistry department from 1993 to 99. Now, Martin has had a, a very distinguished career as a researcher, an entrepreneur, and a senior executive. He graduated with BSc and PhD degrees in physics and chemistry at the University of Toronto. And in 1966, he co-founded OHM Distributors and Manufacturers Limited, an electronics company in Toronto, um, uh, and he sold that in 1969 when he returned to U of T to complete his PhD. So that was, I think, your first foray, foray into entrepreneurship. My first error, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and after a stint uh, at uh, Alcan International in Kingston as a material scientist, he returned to Toronto as a faculty member in chemical physics in 1973. In 2000, he was appointed professor of chemistry and Susan and Bruce Worcester, Dean of Science at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he is uh, currently. From 2007 to 2010, he took on the role of Chief Technology Officer at API Technologies Corporation, specializing in advanced electronics, magnetics, and nano-optics for defense and communications applications. But ever the entrepreneur, he then started Spectra Fluidics, a new company based on technology that he had patented, uh, combining SIRS, surface enhanced uh, Raman spectroscopy with microfluidics for sensing. And from 2010 to 2012, he served as senior VP, academic affairs at City College of New York. Dr. Moskovitz has research interests in nanoscience and technology, plasmonics, sensors, SIRS, nanowire devices, nanoelectronics, and photonics. He's published almost 300 papers, has 18 patents, and has given well over 300 invited talks. He has many honors, of course, including a Guggenheim Fellow in 1986, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1995, winner of the Gerhard Hertzberg Award in 1993, the Royal Society London Award in Surface and Colloid Chemistry, and Fellow of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He served as vice chair of the Department of Energy Basic Energy Sciences Advisory Committee in 2001 to 10 and was a co-principal investigator on an Energy Frontier Research Center, the FRC, grant, and that was a grant to UC Santa Barbara in 2009. He has supervised over 100 graduate students and PDFs. So please give a very warm welcome to Professor Moskovitz. <laughs> Thank you, Art, um, and, and thank you for inviting me to this magnificent place. I, of course, I knew about this building, but I hadn't actually seen it, and this uh, must certainly be the most uh, beautiful and up-to-date um, nano center in the world. I, I think uh, uh, you must be very proud, and rightly so, of this terrific place, and I am humbled by the honor of being the first speaker to speak in a... In a, in a room in, in this building. I had thought to come wearing a hard hat um, as a kind of joke, but they thought that it was too corny and uh, I, I, shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't do that. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not wearing my jacket, but I got good advice to remove it since the temperature um, is, is the right, um, uh, is the right uh, temperature for uh, wearing a shirt only. And the weather outside is way better than California, I can tell you that for sure. So um, uh, putting surface plasmons to work, um, uh, the, uh, 
th this is what I'm going to do. And I won't show you a single SIR spectrum, even though everything that I'm showing you here had its birth through SIRS. And uh, those of you that know about SIRS will see the connection. And those of you that uh, don't, I'm, I'd be happy to discuss it with you during question period or there, thereafter. And although I'm speaking about this, um, really the, the work um, that I'm talking about was primarily done by uh, two outstanding postdocs, uh, Mubin, he likes, it to, him, he likes us to call him Mubin only, so uh, he is Mubin and uh, Jumun Li, uh, a very talented uh, postdoc from, uh, uh, from Korea. And I will flash back to some work that was done at the University of Toronto just to show you how the threads of discovery sometimes take their time to, to come from you know, the wellhead to the, to the pail. Uh, and uh, so I want to talk about work that was done really in the early 80s by uh, Professor Peter McBreen, who is now Professor of Chemistry at Laval University, Todd Stuckless, who, who is in uh, British Columbia. Uh, uh, he, um, uh, he is a professor of chemistry at a community college. Uh, Vladimir Shalayev, a truly uh, brilliant uh, postdoc uh, who is professor of uh, electrical engineering at, at um, uh, Purdue right now. And uh, Costa Dukitis, uh, a very, very bright uh, postdoc who uh, regrettably um, has passed away. And um, what this group shows is that really I only have one outstanding talent. And I, I really recommend that talent to you. If you have to cultivate only one talent, I, I'm telling you this is the talent to cultivate. And it is a tremendous ability on my part to find people of very high talent in whom I can entrust the work and then they do everything, and I get the pleasure of traveling to Waterloo to talk about it. So that's really my si one single uh, talent. Um, so let me just put things in perspective. Uh, everybody knows about uh, photovoltaics. And if you forget about the top and the bottom, this is what a photovoltaic is all about. You have a semiconductor, you create a PN junction um, with either the same semiconductor or different uh, semiconductors, a, a, a P-type and an N-type semiconductor. Uh, at the junction, there is a, um, uh, a transfer of charge, a charge transfers from one to the other and creates a barrier um, and a local potential. Uh, a, a local electrical potential. When a photon comes in, if the photon has enough energy to breach the homo-lumo gap, in other words, the, the, the upper bound of the highest occupied um, uh, orbitals, which normally is part of a band, the so-called valence band, to the lowest bound of uh, the um, uh, uh, highest unoccupied uh, lowest unoccupied uh, orbitals, which is also a member of the band, then um, an electron will be promoted from here to here. And of course, if the photon energy is greater, then that, that's good too, so long as it's not so great that it gets to the top of, of the band. Uh, but that, there isn't much chance of that. Uh, and, and so what you will have instantaneously is a, a, a high energy electron and um, a deficit of electrons in the previously occupied, fully occupied conduction band, which is re referred to as a whole in the same uh, sense that if you have a single car that's missing in a parking lot and one car moves into it and then another car moves into that, etc., it seems like the empty spot is what's migrating, even though it's really the cars that are filling them in. And uh, those electrons and holes feel the potential and they start migrating towards, um, towards um, separate surfaces. And if you can, if you can have um, uh, a uh, wire that takes, uh, takes the, the holes and the electrons uh, and, and runs the electrons that now want to fill the holes through a load, let's say a motor, Voila, you've made uh, useful energy uh, from um, sunlight. 
and this is not news. Um, you know, you can buy these things and put them on your rooftops. You can do other things. For example, if you don't want to use them to run a motor, but you put some uh, ca pro appropriate catalyst here and an appropriate catalyst there, then the electron gets trapped by this catalyst and, and can do reductions because electrons can do reductions and here uh, they can do um, uh, oxidations and you can split water, you can do well, photosynthesis basically. Uh, and, and so um, um, that's um, how things are normally done. And of course, because they've been done so successfully for so many years, we believe that we need this. But really, we don't. All we need is electrons and holes. And we don't care how they came about. Um, and so I'm going to try to convince you uh, that uh, there is another way. And I'll tell you up front, it's, gonna, it's, it's a, an, a relatively inefficient way, but I'm going to show you the first example of such a thing. And I bet you that when the first gallium arsenide um, uh, photocell uh, was made, it probably didn't have the 16% or so that, they, that it has right now. So there's a, a way to go, but it's the first step. And f for that, I have to, to tell you about a phenomenon called surface plasmon resonance. Easiest way, and this is, this is the non-quantum way to look at it, um, you have a, a, a metallic sphere that, that has conduction electrons. The conduction electrons are loose. They're easy to polarize. You put a, uh, an electric field across it, and, and uh, the uh, positive side of the electric field uh, over here will, will draw the electrons uh, up. The negative side of the electric field will, uh, will, well, it won't draw the ions down because they are somewhat more immobile. And, uh, and you know, when the field, if this is a light field which oscillates back and forth, then in the other half of the oscillation it goes the other way and, and it, you know, it, it, it keeps going back and forth depending on, uh, on the frequency of light, 10 to the 15th times per second. And so this is a, an induced dipole, a time-varying induced dipole, and you can show that the polarizability of that induced dipole is given by this, where this is the dielectric function uh, of the metal, and this is the Druda form of the dielectric function of the metal. This is now high school algebra. You put this in there, gather the terms, and you find that this is a, 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 um, a function with a pole where the real part of the complex denominator goes to zero, and that, of course, has a, the form of a, of, a, uh, of a resonance, of an absorption, and the, the resonance occurs at this particular frequency um, uh, because that's where this goes to zero. And indeed, uh, you can observe these things, and they look like this. So, for example, uh, a solution of uh, 50 nanometers of silver uh, has this massive absorption here at around uh, 400 or so nanometers and 60 nanometers of gold has this massive absorption of around 540 or so nanometers. And if you, you, you look at, um, at just how absorbing this is and, and you express it in terms of oscillator strength, uh, which is a kind of way to, to uh, talk about how efficient an absorption is, and a, an oscillator strength of one implies that the, the full electron that was, that was promoted has participated in the transition. And so if you get something that has more than one oscillator strength, it means that somehow many electrons are involved, and indeed these have very large oscillator strengths. And why not? I mean, we do have loads of electrons involved. Essentially, all of the unshielded um, elect conduction electrons in this particle move together. So, so that's the kind of classical way to, to look at it. Um, and, you know, these um, phenomenal absorptions are, are not something that, um, that were discovered yesterday. Uh, this is a Roman cup that has gold-infused glass in it and the kind of violet... Uh, uh, picture, there's a light behind the glass. Um, the violet, pic the violent tint is due to the, these, um, you know, this, um, this absorption there. This absorption shifts with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the dielectric constant of the medium, and so it, it, 
if, if, it's, if uh, you put it in glass, it actually shifts redder, and that's why you get purple rather than whatever that color is. Uh, less, more violet, less violet, whatever it is. Um, stained glasses uh, had uh, ruby glasses, also gold infused. And you know, these metals and oxides were favorites in, in um, stained glasses because the stained glasses received the sunlight, and so organics were bleached in, you know, in, in a, a year or so. And um, uh, the, the great Michael Faraday not only knew that these um, colloids contained very, very tiny particles, but he actually estimated, based on um, mass conservation, what the size of the, them they were. And he got the right ballpark, which shows you that a, a great uh, intuitive genius will normally get the, the answer right, um, and sometimes righter than people who know how to solve partial differential equations, because uh, you, know, you can make a mistake in solving the partial differential equation. But if you have the right instinct, you never make a mistake. That's the, well, anyway, I'm digressing. Um, so, uh, so this actually is his uh, gold colloid that has been uh, kept in the Royal Institution all of these years. And um, when I was in London um, a couple of years ago, I went to pay uh, homage to uh, to Michael Faraday and this thing, and I, I, I was actually rather moved to see that. And um, you can estimate how long um, a surface plasmon lives. And it actually lives a very short time, and so now people have done uh, time domain measurements. But one knew how that they were very short-lived entirely from the homogeneous line width. Now, in a sample like that, of course, there are many, many particles, and so this line width is not homogeneous. It's the average line width of many particles. But if you uh, use um, uh, either a, um, um, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a proper microscope and, and have particles that are s uh, s sufficiently far apart so that you only uh, get a, the image of a single particle at a time, uh, then you can actually find the homogeneous uh, lifetime. A and what you find is that uh, it corresponds to tens of femtoseconds. So basically, when one of these electronic oscillations happen, you excite them, a few tens of femtoseconds later, the electrons dephase. In other words, they no longer move together, but you know, they start moving in other directions because, of course, they start scattering off the, the the boundaries, they, they scatter off the ions, they scatter off vibrations, uh, because of, it, with vibrations the ions are sometimes like this and sometimes like that and sometimes like this, and so the electron cannot uh, establish a standing wave appropriate um, to, to its... Uh, and, and, and so uh, that's why uh, these things deface. And so what happens at that moment? Well, at that moment, um, the... Um, at what, that moment, the electrons that used to be part of this collective excitation become independent electrons which instantaneously have tremendous amount of energy because they have partitioned the energy of the plasmon into each individual electron. They're hot electrons. And they only stay hot long enough for them to thermalize their energy with the lattice. Uh, and so after a while, you know, uh, they bounce around, they hit things, they hit each other, they, they quantum mechanically hit each other. In other words, they, uh, they, their, their correlated motion uh, causes them to transfer energy to each other, they transfer energy to the lattice, et cetera, and they become heat. And that happens in, uh, in less than a picosecond. Uh, and so, so if you want to get the energy of the electrons that do something for you. And if you want to get your energetic hot electrons to do work, you got to grab them before they lose their energy. You got to get them to some interface where they're going to do the work before they get to the energy. And that's why this lecture is in this hall because you know, they, you know how fast they go um, and, and, so, uh, and you know what a femtosecond looks like. And so you need nanostructures. Doing it in some big 
lump of gold or silver isn't good enough because by the time the, most of the electrons get to the surface, they don't have the energy to do anything. And um, so I, I use a, a kind of uh, a classical or semi-classical language in producing this, but the great Kubo showed in this wonderful paper, which is really hard to get actually, um, I, um, nobody subscribes to these old issues uh, anymore. So I, I, I found a piece of it and I, I read as much of it as I could. But he showed that one can do a, a, a quantum mechanical uh, analysis of the surface plasmon in which he basically takes um, the surface plasmon to be a, 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 an appropriate superposition of all of the electron hole pairs and saying that these are electron holes, and I'll leave this for discussion, is a kind of a tricky um, uh, nomenclature, but people refer to them. And so if, if, you, if the plasmon energy is omega, uh, or h bar omega, then, then if you take all of the electron hole pairs that are uh, separated by an energy interval h bar omega, and you do the right kind of superposition, you will get the pla exactly the plasmon. And he showed how to do that. Kawabata and Kubo uh, showed that in, in 1966. And that, of course, immediately tells you how ultimately the plasmon will look after dephasing. It will look like instantaneously like an electron here, and an electron here, and an electron here, and an electron here, and a hole here, and etc. These holes, of course, very quickly move to the uh, Fermi surface because, you know, they, they've got all sorts of electrons there that can just drop in. Uh, but the, but the, the hot electrons will have to, they, they lose energy unless they radiate, and they don't radiate because there are all sorts of K conservation restrictions. Uh, they will lose energy in the ways I talked about before. So, um, so this is what we believe is happening. And the question is, do we have proof that there are these hot electrons or is it just a figment in the minds of theoreticians? And my, my uh, friend uh, um, Bob here, who's a theoretician, he'll tell you that figments of the, in the minds of theoreticians can be often right and seldom, but not zero, wrong. Is that true, Bob? Possible. Okay. So I have it from a th theorist. So um, here's some, uh, I'll go through this very, very quickly because I don't want to uh, waste, um, uh, make this too long. Um, Todd Stuckless did some experiments. He wanted to find these electrons. And so he decided to do photoemission. And if in fact there, uh, there are hot electrons, um, then if he used energy to uh, excite a rough silver surface with um, uh, the uh, uh, photon energy that corresponds to these plasmons, then, then, and then he uses a high uh, voltage extractor, he should be able to extract those, those electrons um, um, and, um, and see if, if, in fact, the rough surface gives you a lot more than the... Uh, any, and yes, the rough surface gives you a thousand times more uh, um, elect, uh, photoemission than the um, uh, smooth surface. But then some of you might say, well, wait, 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 you've just, you've moved the goalpost here. You talked about these particles, etc., cetera, and now suddenly you've got a rough surface. How do you know that the rough surface is anything like particles? Well, that's where Peter McBreen did this brilliant experiment in um, 1982 or so, which we published in 1983. Basically what he did is he, t he made a rough surface by depositing silver on a cold surface uh, at 120 Kelvin. So, and so why does that become rough? Well, because the, elect the um, silver atoms, when they come to the surface, um, they very quickly lose their energy and so they can't diffuse to find all of the uh, holes that they'd like to live in in order to make a smooth film. And so you get a stochastically rough film by virtue of the uh, diffusion limitation uh, of the surface. And then if he, were, he allowed it to anneal uh, slowly and take loads and loads of spectra, at the end he found what the spectrum of 
smooth or smoothish silver looks like. And then he could do the different spectrum between uh, the roughest, the next roughest, because this one has been allowed to, to anneal a little bit, then the next roughest, and then finally uh, no, uh, no roughness uh, at all. And he, he found these big lumps, um, which um, we said, hmm, this looks like plasmons. And so uh, can we, can we um, approximate a rough surface as a flat surface with a bunch of spheres on it? And if so, then the results of, of, um, uh, of uh, stuck, stuckless make sense. And so we did a calculation. So we calculated what the optical properties of uh, a bunch of spheres on a flat um, uh, silver surface looks like, and here they are. And you know, it's not perfect, uh, but it kind of mimics this. And you see that, yes, indeed, you do get something up here in the 500s. And, and then as you uh, warm it up, it shifts uh, to the blue and, and looks more or less like that. So, so that means that, yes, we, we have seen these hot electrons. They're not just a figment of our imagination. They are, are actually created and extractable. Um, and we did a whole bunch of other experiments, we meaning uh, uh, stuckless. Here we have one photon and two photon um, uh, quantum yields as a function of angle of incidence. Um, uh, this fits the, this, these uh, equations perfectly. Why? Because a metal is opaque, and so the amount of absorbed will be 1 minus the fraction reflected, because there's nothing transmitted. And indeed, you, you, and you can calculate this function using, using uh, the um, um, uh, uh, using known equations, uh, and and you see it fits perfectly. For two photon, it doesn't fit that equation at all, and we had to use a, a different um, uh, a different uh, theory altogether, uh, which was worked out by Vladimir Shalayev, and that theory. Uh, said that there would be a transmission factor uh, when you have a rough surface, uh, which measures uh, the, uh, the propensity for hot electrons to breach the surface um, without losing energy, without diffusing. And he calculated this transmission function, which depends really on a single parameter, k. And k is the ratio of the ballistic electrons, the hot electrons, that don't, that don't uh, thermalize and just get to the surface and pass through, divided by the number of electrons that have actually meandered around and hit things, etc., before they got there. And, uh, and this is the fit. Uh, the, these are the collection of points from one, one photon, two photon, S and P, I mean, there are just many experiments, a universal expression, and the ratio of hot electrons to, to uh, already thermalized electrons is four to one. So in other words, most of the electrons in these little pieces are hot electrons that will make it to the surface. So why, why didn't we know, why didn't we think to do what I'm about to tell you we did recently? Well, because you know, the time was not ripe. We didn't, a lot of science had to happen elsewhere for us to understand uh, what, uh, what um, is possible. And, and so, so let me show you uh, um, work that started about four years ago. Okay? And the simplest one is the following. We reasoned as follows. If, the, if these elect hot electrons can make it to the surface, Maybe they can go into the conduction band of a, a, a large gap oxide, like titanium oxide. So we made this very, very simple uh, device. And by the way, I, I had a tour of where your clean rooms and your, your foundry is going to be. That is the future of, of um, this kind of work. You, you need to have a foundry to do these kinds of things where people work interdisciplinarily in order to, to understand how to make devices, how to understand devices, what their photonic, what their materials, what their chemical, what their, uh, what their uh, um, uh, electrical properties uh, are all about. And, and there is no 
single discipline uh, uh, pathway to this kind of work. You can just, you'll go just so far and then you'll fall off the cliff unless, unless you have access to the wisdom that comes from, uh, from other disciplines. And it's a very, very simple device. It's really a TiO2 layer with a bunch of gold particles configured as a simple resistor to um, electrodes. And you, measure, you can measure the resistance, the capacitance, the, the entire impedance, if you want, as a function of illumination. And uh, the way we made them is to put down a, one layer of nanoparticles, cover them with TiO2, put in another layer of nanoparticles, cover it, etc. And, and in fact, you can see this is what they look like. If you pull up the layer, you can see where they were at the bottom. So it, it was a very easy prep, uh, and um, it works. Why do I think it works? Okay, let me show you, let me talk about what I'm showing here. Here is the absorption, the absorbance. It's actually the extinction, but call it the absorbance. Okay, with no gold, basically, see there's a, uh, a, a change in, um, uh, in um, scale there. Basically, all of the absorption is in the UV because uh, of the 3.3 EV band gap of TiO2. So, and that corresponds to about 330 or so um, nanometers. Here there's some lumps and bumps, but almost nothing. When you put the gold, you see that there is an extra a lump here. That lump corresponds exactly to what, to the plasma of the gold. Now we look at the responsivity, which is the, the current per watt. And you find that for the TiO2 in the visible, you have nothing because there are no absorptions. For um, uh, in the UV, yeah, yes, indeed, you have a huge current because you've taken electrons from the filled um, valence band, you stuck them in the empty conduction band, so now they can be mobile, they can, they can do just, just about everything that um, an electron and a metal can do uh, while they, they live up there. And so how do we know that, that this is something that's happening in the TiO2 and not in the gold? Well, because these particles are not percolating. So the only pathway from one electrode to the other electrode is through TiO2 because no two gold particles touch and there is no complete circuit except through the TiO2. And so if the TiO2 did not have electrons in its conduction band on account of illumination by visible light, there would have been no current. You know, that thing would have kind of hung around and kind of become heat or maybe some of it would have been re-radiated as light, but there had been no current. And we get a lot of current. We, we improved, since then we've actually improved it by, 50, uh, by more than that. In this particular example, 20% of the current with white light comes from the visible. So we've improved, uh, we've photosensitized TiO2 uh, in the, okay? And, and you, you can see, you know, we did one layer, no layers, you see nothing. One layer, you see a little bit, two layers, three layers, etc. cetera. Um, and so it all works out. And here I, I already told you the answer. What happens is that um, uh, normally in the UV, this is what happens. In the visible, you actually excite hot electrons in the gold and they, they end up breaching the barrier and, and end up in the conduction band of the TiO2, voila. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go very quickly through, through this. You know, it's a linear effect. We showed that it's a linear effect. It's not a two photon effect. Um, we did a, um, an impedance measurement, full impedance to see what happens to the, um, to the capacitance, in other words, the dielectric constant as well as, uh, as the resistive component. And there are some interesting things uh, that happen. The most interesting is, uh, and you know, we use this uh, um, um, equivalent circuit, which fits really very, very well, from which we can extract 
Um, these are contact resistors, resistances, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, capacitance because we use a thin layer of SiO2 in order to prevent shorting, etc. And then the meat and potatoes is what's happening in the TiO2 uh, with gold or without gold. And, and you know, in the, um, in the TiO2 with no, no gold, pure TiO2, no gold, uh, what happens is more or less what we expect. The uh, dielectric constant that we get is very close to what literature would tell us. When we use um, uh, red light, it hardly changes. When we use UV, it goes up tremendously. Why? Because we've taken something that's poorly polarizable and made it very polarizable because now we've made conduction electrons and conduction electrons are polarizable. So this is not, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I must take my official drink. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the official drink. To your health. Um, where was I before I was rudely interrupted? <laughs> with with, with um, gold nanoparticles, something totally different happens, and I don't understand it. So if there are um, as I'm sure there are many talented people here, maybe you can tell me what, what happened. So in the dark, we get something that's a little bit less, but in the same ballpark. Um, with um, uh, 330, rather than going up to uh, 300, it just goes up a tiny amount. Hmm, that in itself is peculiar. But look what happens when we shine 600. Here, nothing happened, you know. This drops like crazy to um, not quite half, but um, 60%. If you can tell me what's happening, I'd be very, very obliged. And you can publish it, and I will give you the data to, to publish. So what I showed you was the, the kind of zero order experiment. We wanted, we asked the question, yes, we know that there are these hot electrons, we know that we can pull them out of the, um, could we actually put them into something else that we can do um, work with? And that's what that first experiment was all about. Um, and now we dared to ask a more ambitious question. Can we make a, an autonomous photosynthesis device that runs on light alone, solar light, white light, or whatever solar light is, one, AM 1.5, um, so that with light alone, there's a, a reduction end, there is an oxidation end, and they float around like duckweed in a pond, sucking up sunlight and making hydrogen and oxygen. Of course, you know, hydrogen and oxygen is probably not the thing to, to, to make, but it's a start and we could make other things by being clever with what we put in the electrolyte, but let's, let's do that. So our kind of um, um, hope was that, uh, so you know, you kind of design this the way, the, way uh, the, the giraffe might have been designed. You know, you say, well, first of all, you, you know, in, in some of these Af African plains, the trees have leaves very high up, and so let's either make it have very tall legs and, and a very tall neck, or maybe both, et cetera. Uh, the leaves may be rough, and so let's give it a tongue that is, that is like a file that can grab onto the leaf and, and not cut itself. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be a lumbering animal, and so uh, the lions will clearly see it easily, so let's put blotches on it. It's a, that's how we designed this. So, so we use the, the giraffe style. We said, well, you know, one end we'll, we'll use as, a, um, uh, as, as a, a reduction end. And we've already shown that, that electrons will be sopped up by TiO2, so let's put TiO2 there, but now completed by putting some catalyst. And let's not try very hard. Let's just put platinum because we know how to put platinum on it. Eventually we'll put something better, something cheaper, etc. 
And that should take care of the electron. And then, so then there will be a positive charge and we want to treat that positive charge as a whole. And so we want to put somewhere on the second half, on the lower half of this rod, we want to put some uh, catalyst that is an oxidation, uh, an uh, oxygen evolution catalyst uh, like uh, P dot or, or like cobalt or something like that. Um, and of course we don't want to make one, we want to make many, many, and we don't want to float them uh, there because we want to be able to, to examine them before or after. So we'll put them all together in an array of some sort and see what happens. But, but let's approach it one end at a time. Let's do, um, and, and of course, um, um, you, you know, we, we know a lot about the plasmons in, in uh, um, uh, nanorods, partly from very old work and also some very more recent work that did some beautiful calculations that show what kind of resonances you have for transverse excitations, longitudinal excitations, and gap excitations, uh, modes that basically occur uh, between nanorods. And uh, uh, we, we need to have a way to make uh, arrays of gold nanorods. Fortunately, about 40 years ago, um, I uh, worked at Alcan where we, dis we use this technique in which you make porous aluminum oxide that looks something like this. We've got electrochemical techniques for depositing metal in them. And then we can, we can etch away the, the, uh, uh, the oxide material and um, reveal uh, the, the rods so that we can then post fabricate them. And you can see what they look like. Actually, it's almost exactly like this. So this is top views of, of uh, narrow rods and fat rods. This is a side view of the rods. Here's uh, rods that have kind of fallen apart because we've etched away all the oxide. So, so that's just to show you that we know how to, how to do that. And step one is to make a photonic, a plasmonic photocathode. And, and for that, we're going to Treat the, the, we're going to treat the um, nano rod um, as a photocathode and do the, and, and do the anodic uh, reaction in just a platinum mesh that is connected with a wire to it. Why do we want to do that? Well, because we want to be able to study the current and see if, in fact, the current is due to plasmons or maybe it's some, something else. And so we build this thing. We use atomic layer deposition to fully cover the, the um, nano, gold nanorods with TiO2. We put platinum particles here, and by golly, it works. Um, you know, you put uh, white light and visible light on, you get very significant currents. You, you, you chop the light so you can see what, where the dark current is and where the current etc. And uh, you uh, show that the TiO2 doesn't participate. We said, well, you know, TiO2, I mean, there's some UV in the, not much UV, but there's still UV in, in the solar light, and so maybe it's all there. And so we show that, in fact, the effect disappears if the TiO2 is too thick. Um, you, you need to go to fairly thin layers. Now we use about five nanometers to see the photocurrents. Um, and you can show that you, you, can, see, you can see the photocurrents uh, regardless of the direction of uh, illumination. And so we did all the necessary th things. But, but really the important thing is, is on this slide. Here is the uh, extinction, the absorption if you want. And here is the photocurrent. And you see that the photocurrent tracks the gold's plasmon perfectly. And in the UV, it actually becomes very low. So the plasmons are doing all the work. Okay. Now, how about an anode? We use the same trick, except that now, rather than um, using a titanium to uh, um, to cover the whole thing, we, cover, we just cap it off with a bit of titanium oxide, and then we put this cobalt uh, oxidation catalyst electrochemically at the bottom. Um, and you know, this is the artist's conception, this is the aluminum, we make the holes, we, we put 
we fill it with gold, we etch away the aluminum, we put the TiO2, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, what happens here is hydrogen reduction. And, um, um, and uh, so then the oxidation occurs here. How do we know that? How do we know that the platinum and the, uh, the platinum changes roles? Well, we actually collected the, um, uh, the product. Um, we also connect, collected the product here. But you know, the product here was oxygen. And so if you say to people, oh, I collected oxygen, they say, yeah, well, bully for you. There's lots of oxygen around. Some leak gave you the oxygen. But they can't say that about hydrogen because there is no hydrogen around. So if you collect hydrogen, you can say, it happened here. And we did collect the hydrogen. And we did co compare it to, uh, um, and then we did compare it, here it is, the hydrogen producing. We did compare it to the uh, photocurrent. And you, you see that it, it, at steady state, it actually has a fairly high Faradayic efficiency. About 80% of all the electrons that pass through this circuit were collected as hydrogen. And of course, we did all the necessary uh, um, uh, control experiments. We, we uh, showed uh, that it works, that in the UV it gives you very little, in the visible it gives you a lot more. In fact, there's a slow component, which I also showed here. There's a slow component that saturates after about 25 minutes. Um, and, um, and pure TiO2 really doesn't give you anything in the visible. Uh, and visible, uh, but with no um, TiO2 at the tips to kind of pull the electrons, you still get something because, of course, you know some of the some of the holes get to the surface before they get a chance to re to recombine with those hot electrons. But it doesn't doesn't work quite as well. Okay, and again, this is plasmonic. You see, here is the absorbance, here is the photocurrent. Um, most of the meat and potatoes happens in the visible. There is very little in the UV. Okay? So now, can we put it all together? And this is what we're after. We follow, by now we're pros. By we, I mean Jun Li and, uh, and Mubin are pros. They work in clean rooms. Um, they you know, they're not comfortable unless they have those bunny suits on. Sometimes I let them wear it in the lab just so they'll feel comfortable. Uh, but of course, these are, this is a second set because I don't want them to take those dirty bunny suits into the clean room. We, we are very good citizens. We obey all of the rules. I'm just kidding. They never wear bunny suits in the, in the lab. Um, it's difficult to get to the, to the power bars you know, if you wear a bunny suit because you can't get into your, oh, I'm telling you too much. What am I saying? So, uh, so here it is. Here's what we're after. This is what it really looks like. And here's the result. You form oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, at first, the ratio is two to one. After a while, of course, oxygen does leak in because we use a, a syringe to pull out the product through a septum. And, after six hours or what, what not, some oxygen. Uh, and so really it's the hydrogen production that is the, the important thing. And it keeps on going. Here's 66 hours of operation without, without um, change. Um, the efficiency is low. It's just under 1%, which is, you know, not that low, but low compared to anything commercial, but it lasts forever. Why do I care that it lasts forever? Because there are people who have made highly efficient water splitters using materials such as gallium arsenide, cadmium selenide, etc., that have efficiencies upward of 12%. So the gallium arsenide one lasts for about 40 seconds before it photo corrodes because the same, um, the same photochemistry that creates the electron-hole pairs creates the 
possibility for other reactions with the electrolyte. And I think currently there is, well, uh, the titanium dioxide ones, um, they can last a long time. They can last hours. Um, and in fact, there are other ones, but of course, they're all high, they're, ho they're all large band gap semiconductors. And so they only use the UV part of the solar spectrum. So in fact, their efficiency is very low, and there's no way to make them higher because um, that's how they live. Now, maybe we can play with, with plasmonics to, f to photosensitize uh, a typical PN junction type of device. That's something we're going to try too. But for now, uh, what, we can sh what we show is that uh, you have something that lasts forever. Gold is very robust. Um, the reason that uh, we start every six hours, we pull out all of the product because otherwise it, the pressure builds up and the and, uh, thing um, stops because the pressure, the, the chemical potential associated with the pressure um, um, plays against it. So we, ex we suck out all the product every six hours and it starts all over again, but continues forever. And we've, we have one now that's, that's been working for several weeks and producing. And you can even see the, the bubbles. See here, hydrogen bubbles. This is what it looks like. It's about half a square centimeter. Uh, it's sealed in a, in a, a glass vial. And uh, uh, you know, it's very exciting when um, somebody comes and we shine a flashlight on it. After a few minutes, you can see the bubbles uh, coming. And you can see that um, under solar uh, illumination, it produces a lot of stuff. In the UV, it produces almost nothing. In fact, I think that most of this is due to the visible portion of this UV. You notice that this UV filter actually cuts off at 520. Well, 520 is already green, so it's not all UV. Um, and so we believe that we have made the first uh, fully autonomous water splitter that uses uh, electrons and, and holes that have nothing to do with PN junctions. And it has everything to do with plasmonics. And um, that's my conclusions. First demonstration of photosynthesis entirely by surface plasmons. The action spectrum tells the story. The action spectrum is this current versus wavelength. Tells the story. It tells you where it comes from. The best in the world, many weeks of operation. What's left to do? Loads of things left to do. We have to improve the efficiency. And there are lots of things that we did that we knew at the time would result in low efficiency, but we wanted to choose things that we were comfortable with that we had done before. For example, the wires are too close together, and so uh, a lot of the bubbles never m make it out. Um, uh, the, we only have platinum at the top. Now we've, we're making ones for almost the same reason, because we couldn't work underneath. So now we've got the wires further apart. We can have the right kind of area ratio for reduction and, and oxidation. You actually want more reduction sites than oxidation sites, because there's two to one product. Um, in, uh, for reduction versus oxidation. So we could probably um, triple the efficiency just by doing exactly what we're doing, but smarter. But there are probably smarter things that we can do. Um, you, you know, we don't use a, a great deal of gold, and so a go going to earth abundant metals is not so important, except that there's a psychological barrier to using gold. And um, we really should use it with something that produces more interesting products than hydrogen and oxygen. And with that, I am, again, grateful to you for, for inviting me to this marvelous place, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, uh, Martin. Are there any questions? Excellent question. The answer is yes. Um, I actually had a, um, a figure that shows that the, um, the longitudinal uh, ab absorbance peak moves to the red as one changes the 
um, aspect ratio of the gold. This is known both from calculations and, and measurements. And so uh, if you are clever, you can actually create a uh, distribution of uh, rod diameters and lengths. Um, uh, it's not hugely difficult to do that. You need to modify the prep. And then you could actually, um, when, when you get the technique going, you can actually get something that tracks the solar spectrum exactly right, so that you have the right number of absorbers at the right wavelength. Zoya, you had a question. Yeah, I, I was interested if this is something, when you mimic photosynthesis, are you planning to work with carbon dioxide? Uh, uh, the answer is yes, of course. I mean, so there, there are a bunch of, there's some low hanging fruit. Uh, the lowest hanging fruit are the hydrohalic acids, hydrohalic acids, right? So for example, uh, HI, will fall apart to hydrogen and iodine if you just look at it the wrong way. Like, oh, okay, I won't be HI, I'll be iodine, et cetera. HBR, um, you, all you need is a potential of about 0.3 volts. And then you make bromine, and bromine is way more valuable than oxygen. And not only that, but it's liquid, and so the hydrogen goes one way and the liquid goes the other way, and so you don't have to have the... Um, the other thing and, uh, is that we have platinum there, which is a terrible idea because the platinum is also a hydrogen-oxygen recombination catalyst. And so any oxygen and hydrogen that actually gets there will say, thank you very much, it was a nice visit, but I'm going to go to water again. And so that's actually one other reason why we're not really high efficiency. And, and so there, but there are one-way catalysts that are only good reduction catalysts, but not oxidation catalysts. You know, they take more effort, etc. But all of this is what we're doing. So CO is another um, good uh, low-hanging fruit uh, because first of all you can uh, you can make syngas you make CO hydrogen and then that's a useful um, mixture see hydrogen and oxygen is a terrible mixture because it's explosive and it's in just the right ratio and so it it says you know I'm perfect to take your head off but carbon monoxide and hydrogen is far less explosive and, and so you have much more, you can work with larger volumes and then convert them into hydrocarbons and things like that, catalytically. There was one other. Linda. So this pumping of plasmons is a very cute idea. <laughs> um, I guess uh, the first question is, you're not using silver, which must have a better plasmon region to work with than gold because of its propensity to oxidize? Um, the answer is yes. Um, the, the main reason why we didn't use silver is we, we didn't want to deal with uh, oxidation and also sulfidation. You know, there's a lot of pollution, sulfur-containing pollution. That's why the, your silverware turns brown. Um, uh, and so we, we didn't want to deal with that. But in fact, uh, and, and yes, silver is a better material uh, for SIRS. Um, and so it, if we need to count on the, um, on the um, uh, gaps, which we might need to, then silver makes more sense. You get about a factor of 10 more. It's not clear that you'll get more electrons out. It's just the absorption that's, you, you just have more energy packed in the absorption. But in principle, that's true. However, silver also, if you noticed, um, silver also has a much bluer plasmon resonance. And so what Mike said about um, uh, covering, you, you have to work harder to cover the visible. You need to make longer, closer, etc., with silver than gold. But you're right, we wanted to use gold because gold is a foundry-friendly material. Nobody's going to give us any trouble. We didn't have to worry about oxidation. And we wanted to show the principle. Now comes the hard work of really doing it the best way from the point of view of, of the chemistry and the, and the final goals. So two more questions. Um, could you use some metal oxide that has interesting surface plasmons that's metallic? Surely there must be. I wouldn't say buckets of those around, but ones that 
even have tunability of where you want that? Uh, the answer is yes. And, um, and again, you know, something that we haven't really explored is that it's not just the ability to excite plasmons, but the ability for the uh, electrons that are formed to be to live a long time, to to be many of them, mm -hmm. etc. And you know, and, uh, uh, yeah, they would always have to be nanostructured in in some way because not, none of those um, um, none of those uh, plasmons are are very narrow. Uh, so. Um, so there are some other choices. There are a bunch of alloys. Um, uh, actually, metals like aluminum and gallium and whatnot, they're not all that bad, and it's just that they have more complex chemistry. I was thinking more of metallic oxides or some other compound materials in principle that have less metals. And, and there are, for example, all the tin oxides and these, uh, these ITO, these metallic oxides, ITO, et cetera. They, ha they do have plasmons. They do have plasmons. They are regrettable. They have fewer, um, fewer uh, um, electron, uh, electron density is lower, and so the plasmon is in the IR. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, you can probably cover the IR with, that, with those and then silver for something else. I mean, there's no reason why you have to be a single material product. So uh, yes, and I, I don't know if you know Delia Millerin from, from LBL, she, yeah, I just saw her. She, <laughs> so she does, that's her, she's done enormously beautiful work with those. So there, there are options, they're not, as you said, they're not buckets of options, but they're probably two dozen candidates that one really should look at. And that's a really quick question, um, I guess you, the, the thickness of the TiO2 is an issue because of some sort of, you said, you pointed out that you really have to be below 21 nanometers in the region of five or so, and this is because of traps in the TiO2? Right. So you can't get rid of it because of the way you deposit it. Exactly. I mean, basically, we want the TiO2 as a kind of gate. So, you know, the electrons go out, and then once they're out, they're going to be trapped in something else. They won't come back. Um, and so uh, you want them, you want it to be thick enough so that there are no pores and fissures, and thin enough so that you, you're not trapping too many in traps. And there are traps at which you know better than anybody else. Yes, no? So I'm, I'm really far from that field. But at some point in the talk, you presented uh, the surface where we had put some uh, gold nanoparticles. And if you take a rough surface, it has similar properties. Uh, so instead of having the, the nano rods with a rough surface with nano irregularity, well, because intuitively I would think it would be easier to make than having all those nano rods. The answer is yes. I think that you can make rough surfaces that'll have these properties. But actually, the gold nano rods are very easy to make. Uh, and we've been making them for 40 years, and, and also um, you can make them in square meter quantities. In fact, Alcan, uh, when I was there, we patented um, roll-to-roll -roll, uh, techniques for making these kinds of things. I should, as, by way of a uh, historical note, Alcan was interested in metal in these pores from a totally different perspective. We didn't, in fact, at the time, we didn't even know it was metal that was in there. And so I, I actually showed that it was metal deposition that was happening. They were interested in that in order to color aluminum for architectural use. So everybody knows about colored anodic alumina. Uh, you know, you have some beautiful things. For interior use, people use organic dyes, which go inside the pores. And there are ways of sealing the pores, basically just by boiling it in, in water. And the, the uh, oxide crosslinks and traps the dye inside, and the dye can't flow out. But if you use it for architectural use, the dyes bleach. And so what would happen is the early panels, you know, if there was another building next door and the sun only hit half, after about a year, half the building was, was yellow and the other half was brown with a, a line that traced the shadow of the other building. 
on it. And so clearly that was not going to work. So they were looking for ways to, di to dye, to color aluminum oxide that didn't bleach. And this technique, this AC electrolysis uh, in, a, in a metal electrolyte was the way to do it. And they uh, had many, many ele electro electrolysis shops that would produce tons of these sheets for architectural use. It was a big, big product. And, uh, and so there are really good techniques for creating square meters, hundreds of square meters per couple of hours with this. So it's actually a much more controllable thing because I can give you the rod diameter, length, perfectly, and all uniformly. Sir. Maybe uh, just one quick question uh, related to the, the dynamics of the electron injection. Is anything known, say, compared, for example, to, to Gretzel solar cells, you know, ruthenium BP, for example, you know, type molecule functionalized titania? What is the dynamics of, uh, of electron injection in titania in your case versus, for example, something like that? which relates to the lifetime of the, the electrons in excited states and things of that kind. Okay, so um, I don't know how many of you know uh, the Gretzel cell. Michael Gretzel got the Millennium Prize for this phenomenal insight that he had. And he thought as follows. He said, TiO2 is the perfect oxide. It's cheap. It's non-toxic. Um, it lasts forever. It's not corroded by anything. It has only one little problem. It doesn't absorb visible light. And so um, as a UV photocell, it's great, but we need to absorb the whole light. So he said, uh-huh, why don't I photosensitize it? I'll put it next to um, some organic material which has the right absorptions and, you know, you can synthesize organics that'll cover the entire spectrum. And um, with very, very highly allowed uh, transitions, which are both highly absorptive, and of course they have large transition dipoles associated with them, and, we, uh, and if we have them in the right proximity, then by resonance transfer, as they go down, rather than going down radiatively, they, they go down non-radiatively and excite an electron in the TiO2. Um, uh, and um, it works like a charm. It's, it's a beautiful technique. He, they've got now 12%, 10, 11, 12% efficiencies, etc. There's one problem only organics. And as a result, Gretzel's company sells a lot of uh, materials for indoor use because the light is very dim in, in, inside and so it will not bleach. The, okay, so, so then Pavlov's um, um, idea was, can we um, photosensitize, or, or is our mechanism the same as photosensitization? Yeah, so the dynamics of the electron injection. Right. And, and I do not believe that this is resonance transfer. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And, and in fact, the... Um, the, the, the reason has to do with, um, with the fact that we can excite sub-wavelength sub excitations. In other words, we, we, can, uh, we can get electrons into the conduction band that actually have, um, that actually have energies below the barrier. And the only way you can explain that is if they tunnel through the barrier. Okay? And, and so we don't believe that. However, uh, we, we're actually doing an experiment to see if what happens. We're actually going to try to photosensitize, um, uh, photosensitize TiO2 in which the, all of the current comes from excitons as opposed to these plasmons and see if in fact we can do that, and I'll write you and tell you uh, that, what well, happens. I think, well, one of the things that may be useful is to do pump probe experiments, transient absorption to cat fossil intermediates in a, in a, maybe a, in a lifetime you know, measure. Absolutely, and that has to be done, and we'll do that collaboratively with people who have those uh, functions. Any other questions? If not, I'll ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Moskowitz for a fascinating lecture.